All right, let's talk more about gas exchange between the air and the blood. <clears throat> okay, first of all, um, the gases we're primarily interested in, as you guys know, are O2 and CO2. And if we're going to be talking about gas exchanges, we have to talk about concentrations of those gases within the air. You can talk about the concentration of a particular gas within the air or within a fluid. You know, so how many of those gas molecules do you have within a particular volume? That's concentration. Um, so we have to have a way of measuring these types of things. And just like we were talking about air flowing from areas of high pressure to low pressure, remember that diffusion molecules like oxygen gas and carbon dioxide gas are going to move by diffusion from areas of high concentration to low concentration. So in a nutshell, we have to have a way to measure the amounts or concentrations of these gases in, in different locations. All right, so we've already seen, we've talked about how um, in the lungs, we talked about the air pressure in the lungs was about 760 millimeters of mercury. And that is also what, your, what our atmospheric air pressure is, 760 millimeters of mercury. That's the metric measurement for pressure. Like when you hear about the air pressure on the news uh, here in the United States, we give that in inches. So when you hear about, you hear the uh, pressure is 30.12 inches and rising, that's inches of mercury rather than millimeters of mercury. In the metric system, you use millimeters instead of inches. So 760 is an average value. It's not a constant value. Air pressure, of course, changes from high to low according to our uh, atmospheric pressure conditions, weather conditions, and so forth. All right, so if you, uh, somewhere deep in your past, you learned that in the air, we have different kinds of gases. You have N2, that's nitrogen gas, O2, oxygen gas, carbon dioxide, and you have water vapor in there as well. Those are the four main gases that we have in the atmosphere, the air that we breathe in here on planet Earth. As a percentage, this is the percentage breakdown for each of those gases. And in total, they contribute to the overall air pressure of 760 millimeters of mercury. Well, nitrogen gas, for example, is 78.6% of the gas volume in our uh, atmosphere or the gas amount in our atmosphere and so 78.6% of 760 is 597 so that's another that value there 597 millimeters of mercury is another way of measure concentration of nitrogen gas in the atmosphere and it's called the partial pressure what uh, what portion of the overall 760 is nitrogen gas contributing um, O2, oxygen gas, contributes 159 millimeters of mercury of this total 760 uh, value for pressure. CO2 out in the air, the open air, is only 0.3. Water is uh, 3.7 millimeters of mercury. In the alveoli in your lungs, it's interesting if you compare these different gas concentrations in the air that makes it down there into the alveoli versus the air outside. The overall proportion there of nitrogen gas goes down relative to the air outside. Um, O2 gas is actually lower in the alveoli than it is out here in the open air. Well, why is that? Uh, the reason for that is because a lot of that O2 is being absorbed into the blood because the blood's going to take it away to feed oxygen gas to your cells. Uh, notice the CO2 percentage inside the alveoli is about 5.2 percent whereas out in the open air it's only 0.04 percent that makes sense too because the air in the alveoli is taking up CO2 from the blood that CO2 has come from your cells doing cellular respiration as part of their uh, 
metabolism. And then water is actually a greater, water vapor is actually a greater percentage of the gases in your alveoli as well, which makes sense because the lungs are moist, you have a lot of fluid around, and so you're going to have more of that water uh, evaporating and contributing to the gases inside the lungs. So these are the partial pressure values that you would typically find for each of those types of gases within the alveoli of the lungs. All right, we don't need to get too stressed out about partial pressures and, and what all of that means. Um, but when you see these values, when we're talking about these values, that's what it is. It's a measurement of the concentration of those gases either in the air or in body fluids, such as the blood or your tissue fluids. And we need to keep in mind that gases, just like other types of molecules, are going to diffuse from where they are more concentrated to less concentrated. All right, so when you have a greater concentration of something over here and a lower amount over here, that is called a gradient. So you're where you're gradually having a concentration difference from higher to lower. That's called a, a, uh, a gradient. So when we're thinking about these partial pressures or these concentrations of gases, um, we can talk about partial pressure gradients for O2 and CO2. So you have a steep partial pressure gradient for O2 in the lungs. Okay, and so what that means, if we, that's, let's make a comparison. So in the deoxygenated blood that is over here, coming in through those pulmonary arterioles and into the pulmonary capillaries that surround your alveoli, if you measure the partial pressure of oxygen gas, it's about 40 millimeters of mercury once it gets into those capillaries. The air spaces in here in the alveoli, you have 104 millimeters of mercury of oxygen gas in those spaces. So guess which way oxygen gas wants to move? You have 104 in the air, you have 40 in the blood, so it's going to move from these air spaces into the capillaries across that respiratory membrane, that very thin space like you see down in here. CO2, it's reversed, although the concentration gradient is not quite as steep. So the air inside the alveoli has a partial pressure of CO2 of about 40. In the blood, it's about 45. And again, that CO2 has been picked up from your tissue fluids. It was released from cells that were doing cellular respiration. But nevertheless, that's enough to drive the CO2 out of the blood and into the air. That's the way it's going to want to diffuse. So it's these differences in concentrations of these gases that determines how they move. Oops. Okay, and again, we've talked about this respiratory membrane already. It's 0.5 to 1 micrometer thick. That is super, super, super thin. And um, a micrometer, again, is 1 1 millionth of a meter, which is a little bit over 3 feet. So super, super an alveolus and the wall of a pulmonary capillary and the very thin space in between. That is called the respiratory or a respiratory membrane. Interestingly, this is an interesting stat, but if you measured the surface area of all of the respiratory membranes in both of your lungs and added them up together, so all of the surface area of the alveoli um, and those pulmonary capillaries where they're exchanging gases, that would be 40 times <laughs> the surface area of your skin. And so it's that, that's one of the reasons why you, the alveoli are spherical in shape and they're arranged in those clusters because that increases the surface area that you have there for exchange of these gases. If you didn't have that spherical type shape, if everything was just flat or boxy, you wouldn't have as much surface area uh, for gas exchange. So it's very important that that respiratory membrane stays super thin because these gases have to, to move by diffusion.
And so if for any reason your lungs become waterlogged, like with drowning, that would be an extreme example. That's why you die uh, when your lungs fill with water. Or edematous for any reason, edema. If you have inflammation going on around the alveoli in the lungs, like due to an infection, or if you, um, uh, you're a lifelong smoker and smoking has irritated and damaged the alveoli in the lungs, that can trigger inflammation as well. That causes major problems with gas exchange. We talked about congestive heart failure where uh, if the heart is not functioning properly, you have an increase in blood pressure within the pulmonary circuit because the heart is actually not pumping the blood properly um, back out into the systemic circulation. So it tends to back up in your pulmonary circulation and that forces fluid out of those pulmonary capillaries, that increased pressure, and into the, uh, the little alveoli, the air spaces there in the lungs. So that's going to increase the thickness of the respiratory membrane as well. You have a greater distance between the blood and the uh, air inside those alveoli. Emphysema, um, which is usually caused from lifelong smoking, damage to alveoli. You know, what happens is some of them die and it actually carves out bigger pockets inside the, uh, inside the lungs, but that reduces surface area. You don't have as much surface area in a big pocket as you do if that's divided up into lots of little spheres of alveoli that are each doing gas exchange. So that reduction in surface area causes problems with inter, uh, external respiration. What we've been talking about is the external respiration process. All right, so now we have exchanged our gases between the air in the lungs and the blood. And so next we need to transport. That was one of the, the, was the third function of the respiratory system. Um, and then we need to release these gases. We need to release O2 to the tissues and we need to take up the CO2 from the tissue so that we can transport that back to the, uh, the lungs for exchange with the air and the alveoli. So uh, those topics will be the subject of lecture number eight.